Well, good morning. I'd like to invite you this morning to return with me to the book of Obadiah, where we're going to be concluding our, our consideration of this brief but powerful little book. Once again, uh, to give you just a moment while you're turning there, it's, it's just after Amos. Um, I, I want to remind us of something. God's people have always been a singing people. God's creation sang at the dawn of his creative works. Adam sang at the first glimpse of his wife Eve. Throughout scripture, songs are the response to God's work. Whether that's seeing the Egyptians washing up on the shore of the Red Sea after the children of Israel have passed through on dry ground, or whether that's singing the song of Moses in Revelation 15 at the work of God's judgment being poured out. The people of God are frequently the singers of God. In the New Testament, we're specifically told to be teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Music is writ large across the work of God. Last week, as we concluded Obadiah 1, verses 1 through 14, I read the words to one verse from the church's one foundation. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. And looking at that, that particular hymn was one of about a dozen written in the mid-1800s in response to a division that was opening in a group of churches over the inerrancy of Scripture. Imagine that. One of the specific ways that uh, doctrinal error was going to be addressed, particularly something as critical as the trustworthiness of Scripture, was to write hymns that could instruct the people of God. The music is powerful. One of the ways the Lord has instructed us to make use of music is to instruct us. Just before Moses goes up the mountain in Deuteronomy to die, he teaches the people a song. It's a song given to him by the Lord as a witness, it says in Deuteronomy 31, as a witness for me against the sons of Israel. It was going to be a musical testimony to what the Lord had done for them. How they ought to conduct themselves before him. And how they ought to guard themselves against idolatry. So this week as I, as I was putting together this sermon. I, I wasn't too surprised to be accompanied by a few musical reminders. One in particular stood out that I kept revisiting. It was a more recent hymn from just about a century ago that some of you may have heard. It declares in its first verse and chorus, There's a great day coming. A great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? That short and honestly rather unimpressive song announces a reminder that Obadiah puts before us this morning and it asks the question that I would like to ask all of us today. Are you ready? Because, beloved, that day is truly coming. That great and terrible day of the Lord, when all will be laid bare, all those who know the Lord will rejoice, but those who do not will be sent into everlasting torment. Are you ready? It's a certain thing. It's sure. The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, Isaiah 40 verse 5 tells us. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's certain to come. We have a certainty that the Lord will return and every eye will see him. It's, it's for this that we wait. It's for this that we labor. Like Titus reminds us, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Last week we looked at the warning and the assurance that you don't want to mess with the people of God. Here in our text, Obadiah, a prophet of God, is declaring the destruction of the people of the nation of Edom. As I mentioned last week, this is long after Moses. This is long after David. This is a period towards the end of, though not right at the end, of the Old Testament. Israel's kinsman neighbor had looked on Rejoice and eventually participated in the destruction of the people of the Lord. And for their trouble, they would receive their own deeds upon them. But the 
prophet isn't done yet. Today we're going to see how it takes place in Obadiah and what for him is yet to come for Edom isn't merely about Edom. What happens will open with a bang in verse 15 it is a reminder that this is so much bigger than one obscure Near Eastern nation 2,500 years ago. This morning, we'll see as our big idea is going to put it, the kingdom will be the Lord's. I'm going to read our text beginning in verse 15 all the way through verse 21 where you're going to see our big idea. And then before we start to pick our way through it, we're going to consider some keys to understanding prophecy like this one and how all this comes home to us. Because ultimately, this and all of scripture, it's about the greatness of our God. It's about the greatness of our God put on display, unmistakably announced. And the definite assurance that the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So as Obadiah concludes his vision of the people Edom, we're going to consider three things. I'll mention those in just a moment. But look with me beginning in verse 15. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drank... On my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be a stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them. So there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau. Those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead. And the exiles of this host and the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem, her and Sepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Well, this morning I want to draw your attention to these three things. The reckoning on Edom and the nations. The return of Jacob. And the rule and reign of Yahweh. We're going to look at each of those as we see that the kingdom will be the Lord's. We're going to begin first in verses 15 and 16 where we're going to see the reckoning on Edom. The reckoning on Edom and the other nations. We just read them, but I draw your attention back to them. Verses 15 and 16. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. Just in that opening line of verse 15, Obadiah has widened the scope of his lens in these verses. He's still addressing very specifically the nation of Edom, but he's just touched a nerve in the Old Testament, used language that brings a bigger picture. Edom isn't alone. All nations, verse 15 tells us, all nations have at hand in drawing near the day of the Lord, a day of reckoning. A day in which they will receive a recompense, the repayment for their dealings with the people of God. We're going to look more fully at that in just a minute. But even the conclusion of this verse gives us the picture of what that will be. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. This is the perfect justice of God. This justice displayed that as you have done, it will be received on you again. It's consistent with the testimony of Scripture. It's consistent with the eternal character of God. His justice is an essential attribute to the Lord God Almighty. Psalm 97 tells us in its first two verses, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Do you know why it's good news that we are able to rejoice at the reign of our Lord? Because of the settled nature of his rule. Because of the character of his rule is that of righteousness and justice. He's not an arbitrary, capricious God who changes with the times. He's steadfast. He's sure. The very foundation of his reign is his righteousness and justice. 
And even that justice is not an arbitrary thing, by the way. Justice is not external to God. Justice is the execution of his perfect standard. Just a few psalms later in Psalm 99, the psalmist is going to write, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Then verse 4. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. We've walked through many times a, a, a consideration and even l- looking through on Wednesday nights things like the holiness of God and considering that this holiness is one of the things that marks him out as distinct or other from his creation. He is distinct and separate from it. One of the ways that his holiness is displayed, his separateness, is he loves justice. He establishes equity. He upholds justice, not just whatever that means at the moment, but the own execution of his own standard. It's not something that's been established outside of God by the universe or some superior id. Instead, God himself, the creator and sustainer, has established what is just, and he carries out the standard that he demands, that he has established. Some of the words of that song Moses taught the people in Deuteronomy 32 tell us the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are just God of faithfulness and without injustice righteous and upright is he so why why do I linger here why, why do we take just a moment to say all right the Lord is going to return this on the people of Edom and all the nations because no matter what the moments may look like love the justice of the Lord will win out No matter how unjust the circumstances seem in our experience, no matter how corrupt, no matter how unfair, no matter how nonsensical things may seem at the moment, the Lord has not abdicated his throne. He's not abandoned his purpose. His justice is moving irrevocably forward. He will carry it out. That means that all evildoers will be brought to the bar of God. Now we sit far too comfortably when we hear something like that often. We hear, yes, all evildoers will be brought before the Lord and justice will be done. We sort of grin to ourselves, yeah, good thing. For those other people, they better listen. We need to take heed to ourselves, beloved. We're evildoers by birth. We're those who apart from the transforming work of the Spirit of God to bring us life, bring us to life by grace through faith in the Son of God, we will experience the wrath of God poured out on all of our ungodliness. Justice has to do with us, beloved. Because we should by justice alone, if on our own merit, on our own righteousness, We should be the recipients of the judgment for all of our iniquities. But this is where we get to rejoice in the gospel. Because thanks be to God in his justice and his righteousness meeting together in Christ, we're we're made righteous. If we repent and believe that righteousness is credited to us and we have no need to dread condemnation, we're new creatures. But we have to know that dread first. We have to have reckoned with the perfect justice of God that he will punish the wicked. And apart from the regenerating work of God, that is each one of us. We have to be brought face to face with our, like we were reminded already in the the transition between songs of our own inability. We have to call and cast ourselves upon the all-sufficient Savior. Recognizing that even that recognition is by a work of his grace. But he will bring about our own dealings on our head. 
just as he promised Edom, there's a definite wrath of God that's being stored up against all ungodliness to be revealed on that great and terrible day of the Lord. For Edom, who had gloated over the calamity of Israel, who had looted them in their day of disaster, they would get theirs. And truthfully, that's not a popular message, is it? In many ways, it may even seem a little shocking to hear. Somehow a little, a little taboo to be stated in church. Bizarrely enough, we wonder, are we allowed to say that the evildoer will get their recompense? I mean, wait a second. Look, I, I thought God was a God of forgiveness and love. He is, beloved. He is. And his wrath abides on all those who do not believe in the Son. He will deal out retribution and flaming fire against all those who do not obey his gospel. He has eternal damnation for all those who do not fear him. We need to lay hold of this. We can't have an imbalanced view of God that's derived more from our comfort than it is from the scripture. His mercy endures forever and his justice will go forth. In his wrath it will be poured out on all those who do not repent. The idea that the ungodly, the wicked, those who have done unrighteousness will receive the reward of their deeds is a thoroughly biblical one. Proverbs 1, 31 and 33 through 33 tells us that those who do not fear the Lord shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Beloved, it would be awful if we were the judge. It would be somehow wrong if we were the ones dealing out retribution, but we're not. That's not what we're saying. We're not even saying that we rejoice over this. By no means. Rather, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We beg them on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. There's no perverse satisfaction in declaring this. Instead, there's great and wonderful compassion. There isn't morbid glee in the destruction of the wicked, but there is rejoicing that the justice of God is being upheld and his honor is being vindicated. We have to hold both. And we recognize that doesn't come from our hands. But we confess that vengeance belongs to him and he is more than capable of carrying out his justice. For Edom in verse 16 as they drank on the holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. They will drain down the cup of wrath. Where Edom had drank in revelry, all the nations will drink and consume and in the end have another cup. Edom drank in mockery, but one day instead of drinking in celebration, they'll be drinking in the doom of God's judgment, his wrath upon them. They will in return along with all the nations that align themselves against God, they will drink and finish the cup of God's judgment against them. As one commentator put it, not to be overlooked are the ten references to the word day in verses 11 through 14. We looked at last week, on the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, the day of his misfortune, the day of their destruction, and the day of their distress. Edom had her day against Yahweh's chosen people and now Yahweh's promises will have his, their day. But beloved, this is a reckoning not just for Edom. Again, I mentioned the widening scope of all the nations means that there's a universal warning loaded into this. All those who oppose Yahweh and his people will partake of this cup. They will receive their own dealings returned upon them. There will be a reckoning. Their deeds will visit them. And the Lord who's just, who sees all, knows all, will bring every deed into judgment. And so at this point, before we move on to our two other points, well, we've, got to, we've, we've got to take a little detour to understand what has just been said and how big it is. 
So two things very quickly. First of all, the, the nature of prophecy. In the Old Testament specifically, there's, there's what we call, call near-far fulfillment. The prophet will often make prophecy in reference to an event that's about to take place. This would usually be something that's happening so soon that the people who receive the prophecy are able to verify and recognize, hey, the word of the Lord came to pass. This is a true prophet. This is what God said would happen has happened. But that's not the only fulfillment. Many times there may be a far fulfillment, a more distant future fulfillment of that prophecy that is greater in scale and in scope to redemptive history. This is especially true when it relates to that topic that Obadiah just dropped in our laps. The day of the Lord. Which is the second thing that we need to talk about very quickly. The day of the Lord. This phrase, that, that, that statement, the day of the Lord, it shows up about 20 times in the Old Testament. Especially in another little Old Testament book near here, the book of Joel. You'll, you'll see this phrase come up frequently. And the day of the Lord is this massive theological topic throughout Scripture. And it's a reference pointing to the pouring out of God's wrath against all ungodliness. In the Old Testament particularly, we have it consistently portrayed as a day of reckoning, a day of darkness and gloom. Destruction for the enemies of God. Signaling the restoration of God's people and as a point of comfort to God's people who are presently being afflicted. Where these two issues meet is that there are prophecies about what we can call many days of the Lord. There are events that are destruction of Judah's enemies, like the destruction of Assyria or Babylon or the destruction of Edom's territory. They're going to happen. They can be observed, but they're just a glimpse. They're a terrifying preview of the far fulfillment of the ultimate day of the Lord. That there is that great day coming. Most frequently, the day of the Lord is in reference to judgment. It's this signal phrase that there's the just destruction of the enemies of the Lord. Around it, you'll see references to the people of Yahweh being restored to their homes, the throne of Jerusalem being exalted, the sanctity of Jerusalem being reestablished. But it's clear in every instance, the day of the Lord will be awful for those who are not at peace with him. We had this passage for us in our scripture reading, but I'd point us back to just one reference to the day of the Lord in Isaiah 34. If you want, you can be turning there, otherwise it should be there on the screen. You'll see in Isaiah 34 some of the key elements that are often mentioned. Just like in our text, there's this reference to all the nations. Isaiah 34, 1 begins, Draw near, O nations, to hear, and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains here, and the world and all that springs from it. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations, and his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. You see this terrifying picture. This picture of the Lord's judgment being poured out on his enemies, even as it continues into verse 3. So their slain will be thrown out, their corpses will give off their stench, the mountains will be drenched with their blood, and all the hosts of heaven will wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll, all their hosts also will wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from a fig tree. For my sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. By the time you get to verse 8 in Isaiah 34, you'll see another ma major recurring image. One that we'll see in just a few verses in Obadiah, that of burning. Isaiah 34, 8, For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams will be turned into pitch, and its loose earth into brimstone, and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever from generation to generation. It will be desolate. But, but why? why? Why are we even looking at this? Why, why would we want to think about something so terrible, so awful? Why, why would we want to imagine in your quiet time if you come across Isaiah 34 on a particularly rainy morning? There's an impulse to say, oh, I don't want that. But why not, beloved? Recognize this is profitable for us. We 
We have to believe scripture. It is profitable. There are words spoken in due season, but we should never neglect these portions of scripture and say, you know, that just makes me nervous. It, it makes me uncomfortable to see God talking about the stench of corpses that he's laid out. Why would we ever want to consider something so awful? Well, beloved, because God means it. He means it. Because it's in the book and God wrote the book. Don't delude yourself and think that this is just an Old Testament thing, Old Testament thing either. The day of the Lord comes up there too and it's consistent. It's just as awful there as it is in Isaiah 34 or Joel 2 or Ezekiel 7. We can't pretend like this isn't who God is as he has revealed himself. He has declared that this is the future for all those who do not repent. We can act like it's not true because we're too sensitive or it's too painful or because it's unpleasant to our sensibilities. As long as it occurs in, you know, scripture. We, we can watch it all day long on television. We can talk about it. We can be entertained by it. As long as it doesn't come home from God who's just. No matter how we feel about it, beloved, it doesn't change who he is. It doesn't change what he has said or that we will endure this if we reject him. By the way, we can't escape this, beloved. That's the glory of this picture for believers. The, the day of the Lord for those who are in Christ isn't darkness. For us, for those who are in Christ and have received his righteousness, the day of the Lord is terrible to behold, but it holds no wrath for us. Because he suffered for our sake. Because wrath was poured out on him. Because he endured the cross. This is not a darkness for those who are in Christ. We've been freed from the fear of this death by the living hope in Christ Jesus who loved us and who gave himself for us. Who drank the cup by the will of the Father. This takes us to our next consideration. Back to our three points for this morning. We've just looked at the reckoning on Edom and the nations. Now we're going to consider the return of Jacob. In reference to these verses, beginning verse 17, really all the way down to verse 20, Charles Feinberg writes, Whereas Edom can expect only destruction in the windup of God's prophetic program, Israel awaits a restoration from worldwide captivity. Where Edom and the nations will be drinking the cup of their own destruction, verse 17 tells us, But on Mount Zion... There will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be as stubble. They will set them on fire and consume them. So that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, They'll also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the cities of the Negev. I don't know if you realize this. 19 and 20 both begin and then end with they're going to possess the Negev, the territory that had belonged to Edom just as God said in verse 17. They will possess their possessions. Beloved, one day after every other mountain has been laid low, Zion will be exalted. The mountain of God will be raised up and the nations will stream to it. Only those left in it will be left alive. They will be spared the wrath of God. We get a picture of this in Isaiah 2. It's an identical picture. But you may realize we're spending time in Obadiah and then we're going to see this other places because one of the glorious realities that we have in Scripture is its integrity. It holds up to scrutiny. As you dig deeper, you see, it says it here and here. And here 
and then all the way over there. Centuries removed from one another, languages apart. It testifies to its trustworthiness. Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountains of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Will be raised above the hills. And all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. The enemy teach us concerning his ways that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. In verse 17, you see this reference to Jacob in our text here in Obadiah. Again, like we saw last week, it's highlighting that relationship. It was Jacob that God sovereignly set his affection upon was merely his choice. That, as we mentioned last week, Jacob, the father of the nation of Israel, as his name will be changed to, his brother was the father of the nation of Edom. Edom comes from Esau. Here is Obadiah brings out that relationship once more. The house of Jacob. It's a whispered reminder of God's sovereignty. Why is Edom not redeemed? Well, Paul tells in Romans 9 verse 11, so that God's purpose according to his choice could stand. God is God and we're not. He's working out his purposes of his exaltation. Whether it's in the birth of twin boys or preserving his people for his namesake, he will be exalted. All of these things, all of the moving and shattering of nations, all of the exalting of Zion and casting down of other hills and mountains and power, and all of the prestige that Edom thought that they had, what is all of this about? It's about the glory of our great God and King. But the same is true today. As we see nations rising, as we see men exalting themselves, as we see chaos burning around us. God is on his throne and he will be exalted. As Obadiah's vision continues, we see in these verses some of those characteristics of the day of the Lord. The possession, the burning in verse 17, Jacob will possess their possessions. This would have been especially reassuring to people who had just been dispossessed. This is what God consistently does in his word. In fact, it's, it's the theme of the book of Lamentations that things are awful in the moment, but the mercies as we were reminded of already as we sang, which we didn't consult on this. Happy providence. Things are awful in the moment, but the mercies of the Lord will outlast the moment. It's the message of text that we know, like Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is the promise of the gospel. Take up your cross and follow me like the Lord says in Luke chapter 9. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. But we don't live with our eyes fixed only on the present. We have our eyes fixed on him. We have our eyes fixed on him who does all things well. Verse 18 is yet another look at the conflagration that's going to come upon the enemies of God. But these next verses, verses 19 and 20, they promise that the Lord will gather in his people. And there's a few wonderful dimensions to this. First, there's the faithfulness of God. This is consistent to the Mosaic Covenant. All the way back in Deuteronomy 30, Moses reminds the people and instructs them that when repentance is granted... Deuteronomy 30, verses 3 through 5. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If you're outcasts or at the end of the earth, from there the Lord God will gather you and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. If you were to take the time and look through, survey those place names. 
can, can I just add a little plug here for careful study of God's word? Nothing's in extraneous detail. The words are specific. The words are intentional. The words, beloved, are the words of God. They're inspired. They're there on purpose. When there's given these place names, as you study God's word, take time. Take time. Look them up. See. Be a diligent student of God's word. What's going on here? Where where are these place names? Well, they indicate some of the boundaries the Lord had already granted to the people of God that had through the days and years of their idolatry, through the years and days of their sliding away from God's favor in disobedience, those lands had been ceded to their enemies. But the Lord says, no, 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 when there's repentance, when I triumph... I'm going to give you all that I promised you. This same theme is reiterated at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles 6. It's a theme of the progression following the day of the Lord. That the people will repent and possess all of their land just as Yahweh swore. He made a promise to Abraham and he will fulfill it. He's going to do exactly as he said. We don't need to conflate Israel and the church. We, we don't need to twist these verses to say, well, this is superseded by the New Testament. God won't actually do all that he promised. No, 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 no. He will do it and, and more. One of the commentators particularly that I read said, the territorial and imperialistic emphasis of the, the passage here is embarrassing to the Christian reader. I wanted to throw the book across the room. <laughs> what? There's something embarrassing here in Scripture? By no means, beloved. He goes on, I'll I'll paraphrase what he says next, but he essentially says, it's okay, Obadiah didn't know what we know. Well, that's partially true. Uh, Obadiah didn't have the full revelation of God as we did, but he still had confidence that God wasn't merely being allegorical. He had confidence that when God said something, he meant it. That the land will literally be repossessed by God's people because he swore they would. We don't need to apologize or be embarrassed for God's word ever. The point Obadiah is making on the divine inspiration is that God will restore his people. The reference even here to the house of Joseph in verse 18 he he moves very swiftly as you see this the house of jacob will repos- well excuse me will possess their possessions then the house of jo- jacob will be a fire and the house of joseph a flame well the house of joseph it, it's including even those tribes of the northern kingdom i made reference already that we're late in the old testament here in obadiah this is after david this is after solomon and after the kingdom had been divided Again, according to the purposes of the Lord. In discipline to his people, there had been a division in the nation of Israel. The northern kingdom followed always in this pattern of idolatry until finally they were swept away by the Assyrian nation. As we mentioned last week very briefly, Judah, the nation to the south, consisting of Judah, Benjamin, and many of the Levites. They, they continued faithful for a while, but didn't learn the lesson of their neighbor. That idolatry would bring about the judgment of the Lord. Those tribes in the northern kingdom, humanly speaking, they're, they're lost to us. There's all sorts of fun speculation as to where exactly they went. There's all sorts of, well, I think maybe over here, and maybe this thing, and... Who knows? Maybe we could parse this out someday. But we know both from Revelation and from Romans, Paul and John, and really God himself through those men. Just as we can be excited about God's election of Jacob in Romans 9, we can be excited about God's faithfulness to his people in Romans 11, whom he has not rejected. There will be this restoration. There will be this gathering in. And humanly speaking, sure, 
How, how in the world is it going to happen? How there's going to be all of these? We don't even know who these people are. The Lord does. His arm is not shortened. Verses 19 and 20 are promising that from every point of the compass, from the Negev in the south, to the Philistines along the western coast, to the territory of Ephraim and Samaria in the, in the north, to the regions of Gilead and Zarephath, that these farthest flung re regions, the Sepharad, the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel, they're going to possess the cities of the Negev. They're going to take possession of what had been Edom's. There's this wonderful dimension of this where the Lord is faithful to his people. The Lord is caring for those whom he has promised and sworn to. And this wonderful assurance has a dimension for us Gentile believers as well. You see, his dedication to his people is a wonderful assurance for us. Because as Jesus assures his followers in John 6, this is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. In other words, we are confidently kept by the Spirit of God, sealed until the day of redemption, and we can in no way lose or be lost by the God who did all the finding. We will be gathered in. Which brings us to our third and final point for this morning. The rule and reign of Yahweh. The rule and reign of Yahweh. Obadiah's vision concludes in verse 21. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. That reference there, the deliverers, it may be translated differently for you. It has the idea of those to whom the Lord is entrusted to be his stewards, executing on behalf of his kingdom. We see that throughout scripture. E even in the promises of the church, the apostles, they're going to reign with him. It's clear all the way to Revelation 20 verse 4. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. There's this assurance of the presence of the people of God and the rule and the reign of God. But the real exclamation mark on the book, the real promise is that no matter how these things appear at the present, the kingdom will be the Lord's. Specifically, Obadiah is referencing Edom. The Lord is going to take possession of it. He will trample them, execute them, bring them to an end, and it's going to be his. But ultimately, and this is signaled by the fact that this is introducing this section with the day of the Lord, this is speaking about ultimate, grander, final things. We can have confidence that one day all the kingdoms of the earth will be the Lord's. If you remember last week, we said this vision is given with Jerusalem burning in the background. No matter whether it's from a minor defeat suffered at the hands of the Edomites, or as, as I said last week, I believe this is happening after Babylon has raised the city. Whatever the case, things don't look good in the moment. But all that, all that aside, the Lord has spoken. The kingdom will be his. Recurringly throughout scripture, we're assured that all power and authority belongs to him. It's the constant refrain of angels that circle the throne of God. All power and authority and dominion and glory and honor are Yahweh's alone. He is executing it. And in his perfect timing, he is bringing all of these things into the experiential subjection in the eyes of his people. The Lord reigns presently. We have no need to fear. Beloved, whatever circumstance we may be facing, whatever difficulty, whatever question mark is looming large, what reorientation does that truth bring to our hearts? The Lord reigns. The Lord is in control and he's bringing about his perfect plan. Bad day, the Lord reigns. Bad diagnosis, the Lord reigns. Bad year, the Lord reigns. 
Beloved, the kingdom will be the Lord's. Let the earth rejoice. Calvin, writing on this text, says, The Lord hastens not after the manner of men, but at the same time, he knows his own seasons. It, it may be a, a situation where we're wondering, along with the psalmist, How long, O Lord? It, it's been an awfully long time. There are those who are mocking. That, that's taking place 2,000 years ago when the New Testament's being pinned. Saying, where's the promise of his coming? Everything's continuing just like it always has been, isn't it? Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. The Lord does not hasten after the manner of men. He knows his own seasons. The Lord isn't late. The Lord isn't dragging his feet. Even in the delay, we're reminded by the Apostle Peter, it's accomplishing his purpose. It's bringing about the glorification and the exaltation of his name. We've been reminded often from this pulpit that the reason the sun came up today is because the Lord is still saving his own. The Lord is still saving his people. I mentioned that as I prepared for this sermon, I was accompanied by several songs. Among them were two numbers from George Frederick Handel's Messiah. Particularly the lines from the Hallelujah Chorus that are drawn from Revelation 11. If you're unaware, that whole work of Handel's Messiah, it's all drawn from text of Scripture. Drawing from Revelation 11 verses 15 through 18, the Apostle John records for us, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. But by the way, it's not enough that there's this mere singular proclamation. Verse 16, And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were enraged and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, the small and the great and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Beloved, there's a great day coming. There's a day coming when this will no longer be down the road. Do you know how most frequently the day of the Lord is referenced in the New Testament? It's like a thief in the night. It will steal in upon us. Well, but so often our attitude towards these things is to trust in time and not in the Lord. To trust in our own experience. I will settle this later. We presume upon the grace of God and say, I have time to continue, finish the sentence, to continue in rebellion to the living God whose air I breathe, whose world I inhabit, whose universe I use while I spurn his commands. He'll let me live long enough to fix this right at the last second. Oh, beloved, we ought to tremble. The Lord is abundant in loving kindness. And yet we're warned. And yet we're warned. Don't neglect this so great a salvation. Don't neglect this message. Today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. Beloved, this reminder that the Lord reigns and that his reign is imminent. That all that we have heard is coming and will soon come to pass. This reminder is a wonderful thing. Not merely for the unconverted. For the unregenerate. There's an element in this where as believers we can sit and we, we can say yes that's wonderful. It's a truth. It's something I hold to. I'm excited. I'm trusting in that. And it no longer applies to me. I have escaped the wrath to come. Alright. 
are, are you looking forward to and hastening his appearing? How does this reality affect your fight against sin? I love the example of godly men from history. One of the ones that is so significant in this regard in particular is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is a young man. Penned 70 resolutions. Things that he would read through on a weekly basis. To remind himself of his pursuit. His singular uh, aspiration to do all things in submission to the glory of God. And among them there's at least three if I remember correctly. At least three. Where he said... Consider this thing that I'm about to do. If the Lord were to appear in an hour, would it be something I'd want to be found doing? That'll change the way you handle your day. When I consider that I will one day stand before the Lord and give an account, do I want to do this? Is it worth it? If I were to hear the trump sound in the midst of this thought, this pursuit, this attitude, this season of my life. So often I have this conversation frequently with, with folks as we talk about the end. As we talk about <clears throat> what scripture tells us in regard to the coming rule and reign of our Lord to be extended upon all things. We're not commanded to try to wheedle out every minute detail. We, we are told to recognize the signs of the times. We are told to be aware. We are told to study these things diligently. But you know what we're most frequently commanded, especially by the Lord himself in regard to these things? Watch. Be ready. Be ready. What manner of lives ought we to live with all holiness and godliness, seeing that all these things must be? We're to be ready. As those in Revelation sing, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So beloved, Obadiah gives us this wonderful reminder, warning. The kingdom will be the Lord's. There's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a restoration. There's going to be a reign that never ends. What remains, and, and what this has to do with us, is this. Are we looking for that blessed hope? Are we eagerly longing for it? Or are we secretly wishing that he'd hold off a little bit longer? And if so, why? Why? Sometimes we believe we have really good reasons. Well, this is the stage of life that I want to get to. There's this season that I'd like to enjoy. There's this loved one that doesn't know Christ. But beloved, far better. Far better to be with him. Do we see him this way? Do we see the return of Christ and long for it? Do we have that idea of our longing eyes will be blessed? Do our eyes have any longing for the rule and reign of Christ? Or are they longing merely for this world? Is our vision so cluttered with things that are passing away? Are we so taken up with the moment, the smoke rising from Jerusalem, that we can't see the kingdom will be the Lord's? Are we living steadfast lives of godliness that testify we're waiting for that day? Is it unmistakable in the shape of our life that this world is not our home? That we're looking for a better country? We're longing for an eternal home. That all these things will be burned up. I wonder what that would do for us, beloved. If, As we walk through our day to day. As we prepare for the holiday season. We need to shop early to get everything here by Christmas. All these things will be burned up. Beloved. 
all that you see, all that we hold so dear. These things have been given to gladden our hearts. We're to use his gifts well. We're to use them rightly. We're to hold them loosely. Seeing that all of these things will be dissolved. We read it in Isaiah 2. Let me roll up like a garment. Are we living such a life of steadfast godliness that it's apparent to others? You know, it's clear that this world is not everything. It's clear in the shape of their life, the patterns that they have, the pursuits that their whole life is bent towards. They're pursuing something else. But we all have to live in this world. We all have to pay our bills. We all have to do these things. But so often we stop there. Well, I do have to pay my bills, so I can't... What? Be faithful in the things that God has called us to do? Or the commands, the commands of the Lord, they don't, they don't conflict with one another. We're to do all these things to the glory of God, whatever it be. Lastly, I would ask, are we warning others of the wrath to come? Are we warning others of the wrath to come? As we recognize this, as we embrace this, as we rejoice in this, as we take heed to these warnings, as we agree, affirm, and are adjusted in our pursuits of these things, do we say, and they don't know, and they must be warned? And have I faithfully testified the grace of our God who is coming? Are we warning others of the wrath to come? The kingdom will be the Lord's. In another section of Revelation, John pulls back the curtain on the throne room of heaven. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, This also is reminded to me by Handel's Messiah. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. The kingdom will be the Lord's. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing in every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshipped. The kingdom will be the Lord's. The great day is coming. Are you ready? Pray with me. Our God, you are the King who sits enthroned. Lord, you are working all things according to the counsel of your will. Father God, you will receive glory. Every knee will one day bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. That you have given your Son and that his obedience, even unto death, death on a cross to reconcile us to you. He's been given that name. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We ask that we would be strengthened by this reminder from your word that your servant has penned not just for that time but for all time. 
as a precedent, as a reminder, as a glimpse of the glorious future that await those who fear you and of the terrible day of those who don't. Lord, you have granted all things to us that we would please you. Father, I, I don't ask for grace to accomplish these things. Rather, Lord, I ask that we would be using those things that you've given us, the grace that you have saved us with, the power that you give us through the indwelling spirit to be obedient to these things, that we would use those gifts that you have given us for the glory and the honor of your son's name. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.